Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Airlock, and in this talk I will lay out my presentation for the Lewis Carroll Society of North America, which I had the good pleasure and great honor of doing the other day, and much love and happiness to the Lewis Carroll Society of North America. I talked a little bit fast, and I ran out of time at the end, so I am going to post this on my channel, which is me talking out my talk as best I can, so that this version, as well as the online version uh, with USC and USC Library and the Lewis Carroll Society, will put out at some point. But I told them I would put out a longer version of the talk, and this is that. So, in this talk, I will present the best evidence of substance, only the best and sweetest of butter, that suggests Wonderland and the Looking Glass can teach children Aristotle's ten logical categories, from lowest to highest, the way a passionate child would look upwards to adults of substance, and that the Snark Hut, following Alice's adventures, is likely a logic problem, like those Carol posed in his works on logic, nonfiction, and solved by finding a category of Aristotle and assigning one of the ten to each of the ten hunters. I will end with an outline of my theory that Carol's three famous fantasies teach three of the most basic ideas of Aristotle's logic and ethics, two from logic, one from ethics. The lessons one would teach a child with illustrations and memorable examples, if you had any inclination to teach Aristotle to children, and we know Carol did, and went on to design a game of logic and then symbolic logic to further teach young children and people of all ages Aristotelian logic. And at least one of the three ideas I am concerned with here. First, the ten logical categories. The central idea of Aristotle's first book on logic, the first of the collected works of Aristotle's works on logic known as the Organon, and the first book is the categories, and there are ten of them. Those ten categories, in the er order, Aristotle himself lists them, but backwards, as if in a mirror, fit very, very well the order of events and characters of both books, chapter by chapter. The majority of this talk will be me laying out all of that and the how they walk along fitting well chapter by chapter wonderland and looking glass and then they seem to be the 10 mixed up of the 10 who hunt the snark that will be the majority of this talk second the four forms of proposition, the central idea of Aristotle's second book on logic, on interpretation, and then it goes into the four forms of the perfect syllogism. Uh, those who are familiar will know in the third book, uh, prior analytics into the fourth, uh, posterior analytics. So the two ideas of the categories leading into the four forms of proposition is a lot of what of Aristotelian logic you would teach somebody if you had to introduce it to people, and I do. So the four forms of proposition, and also the four forms of proposition is the idea of Aristotle central to modern logic. Boole, De Morgan, and Carroll's own work on logic, Carroll's puzzling syllogisms, and his game of logic. The four forms of proposition of Aristotle unquestionably form the basis of Carroll's game on logic, the board game he invented to teach children these same four forms. And these fit well with the four royal court characters of each of Alice's adventures very well. They fit the white rabbit, who is some and some, the duchess, who is some not some, the queen of hearts, who is uh, none, and the king of hearts, who is all. In the second book, that would be the red and white uh, queen and kings of hearts, and I believe the queens are the universal because queens in chess move the full length of the board or can, and the kings only can move one space and they are the particular. And I think that the female universal male is universal to particular and the white to red itself. Well, I have yet to lay out the uh, color scheme, but the white to red certainly seems like white is positive, not good, 
but sort of timid and mild like a child white, which is a theme of the works. And then red, like with the red queen, all these ways are mine, who is none, is negative. I do believe that the four forms of proposition, which is an idea Lewis Carroll would like to teach to children and then did, but and it would make sense, it, there are four royal court characters, and those four royal court characters of each story do uh, fit enough the four forms of proposition that I think that was intentional. Now, in the end of Wonderland, there are only three of those characters. The Duchess is not there. Lewis Carroll, in his uh, Game of Logic, says, all you need, and he only has three kinds of tokens, you only need all, none, and some. You do not need some not, which is why the Duchess takes a hike. I think that that is the clear way that that makes sense. Third and finally, the central idea of Aristotle's ethics. So if you needed two ideas from Aristotle's logic to teach children, the logical categories, the ten, and the four forms of proposition, the four, would be the two ideas central to Aristotle's first and second book of logic of the Organon, which would make the most sense. Also, I do believe that's 10 and 4, which make 14, and the sheep in the middle of the second book is knitting with 14 pairs of knitting needles, 10 plus 4. But third and finally, balance between extremes is the central lesson of Aristotle's ethics. The Nicomachean ethics is where that is most presented, and the use Aristotle makes of the colors red, white, and black, not in the Nicomachean ethics, but in the categories. And in the analytics books, in his works on logic, Aristotle considers the colors white and red and black, he associates that with ignorance and the crow, they, it looks like Lewis Carroll is using red, white, black, and uh, consistent with ways Aristotle himself uses those terms, would know that if somebody went through Aristotle's work carefully, they could find the way that he is using those color words. And then he also suggests gold, with the golden key and the golden afternoon, uh, and, and in the snark, it begins with a golden theme as well. That there is golden balance beyond the unbalanced red and or white down here. And there is something golden beyond uh, the world. And Carroll certainly seems to believe in that. He also seems to believe Aristotle did not appreciate the true golden, uh, the true, uh, what was golden beyond substance. And Aristotle puts substance highest. So that is another interesting theme in all of this. So, Dun Scotus, who lived from 1266 to 1308, and William of Ockham, who lived from 1285 to 1347, who are almost as ancient as Oxford and Euro European universities themselves, are the two famous Neoplatonic philosophers and logicians of early Oxford, who wrote commentaries on Aristotle's logic and ethics and taught logic centuries before Carroll and his peers followed in their shadow. Unlike these early Oxford alums, modern philosophers and logicians, including Kant, Mill, De Morgan, and Boole, have ignored Aristotle's ten types of being as bygone cosmology. It is not clear whether Aristotle intended the text to be a complete closed system or open general discussion, but in the text he lists and explains ten categories of truth, which are not totally exclusively separate, they are actually interwoven, like a sheep with knitting needles, all interwoven in the world, but they are ten different things we can say about things. Substance, the material being of this or that thing. Quantity, the number or amount of a thing. Quality, the, an aspect of a thing, such as good or green. Relations, the interaction of a thing with others. Space, the place a thing is in and occupies. Time, the duration of a thing and the things it involves. Position, the situation of a thing with other things. State, the current status of a thing in terms of itself. Action, what a thing does to itself or other things, and passion, finally, and the lowliest. Passion, what moves a thing to this or that action. Aristotle discusses substance first, the basis of truth and being itself, and proceeds only somewhat in his own stated order to illustrate many but not all of the ten, leaving the last few, including lowly passion, largely unillustrated. Aristotle says of the rest, that is, time, place, and state, they are so clear that I need say no more than I said at the very beginning. It may be Carroll found further illustrations necessary and put them in the hands of children. If we turn Aristotle's own list of categories backwards, the ten, starting from, though, the lowest rather than, as he does, from the highest, like looking at the Jabberwock text backwards in a looking glass, we have passion, action, state, position, 
time, space, relations, quality, quantity, and substance. And this inverted list fits the order of events and characters Alice encounters in both of her adventures, with the two books mirroring each other, chapter by chapter, so well that it can be argued Carol intended to teach children lessons about logic whether or not they knew how they were being trained during play. In Wonderland, the first adventure fitted to Aristotle's inverted list. The white rabbit is passion, the mouse is action, the dodo is state, the rabbit's house is position, the caterpillar is time, the Cheshire cat is space, the duchess is relations, the mad tea party is quality, the queen's garden is quantity, and the king's trial is substance. I do believe Carol, of course, came up with this first and then patterned the looking glass mirroring the mirror of this. Space shares space and a chapter, which is the most confusing part, but makes consistent sense between the two stories. Space does not get its own chapter. It has to share a chapter and space itself with everything, but particularly with something in the middle. And in Wonderland, uh, the Cheshire Cat is in the house of the Duchess, sharing a chapter in space with relations, which makes a great deal of sense because relations happen across position and space, as the cat describes in that chapter. And the last few chapters of Wonderland are about substance, but at first lack thereof, from the mock turtle to the trial of the recovered but at first stolen tarts, which would be absence of some substance in all the lives, lies, and then the trial of tarts recovered, substance recovered. As Wonderland opens, all in the golden afternoon, a golden mean between day and night, Alice is full of passion but frustrated in many ways. Bored as she wants to join in something with her sister, but uninterested in a book without pictures or conversations. She considers weaving a white daisy chain as the white rabbit runs by, worried and late. Passion bonds us, and Aristotle said we share passion with beasts, but we use language and logic, which is why Alice is amazed by the rabbit. Allo Alice follows burning with curiosity without a thought of how to get back. The hole dips, and she falls in without time to think, as she is so passionate. It is too dark to see, but she falls past diagrams, maps, and containers, empty of substance, such as a jar without marmalade, which is desirable but contents absent. Passion without substance, just as when you take a do bone from a dog, the temper remains, as the queens tell Alice at the end of the second book. As she fa falls, Alice worries about killing someone below, worries what opposite others will think, and worries her cat will miss her. Many worries, many passions. Alice thinks of Dinah, her cat, asks herself if cats eat bats, and then if bats eat cats. There is not only desire and consumption, I do agree with Mark Burstein's comment and suggestion in the Night Letter publication that this also fits. Uh, there's a famous Zen story in which uh, a, a Zen master is told by a monk, well, I think that Buddhism is saying that things are subjective, and the student is told, well, in that case, it must be very hard to lift your head off the floor every morning if that rock out in the courtyard is inside your head and inside your mind. That the subjective is in the objective and the objective is in the subjective with the two as yin yang, the Zen uh, in China, the Chan, are into Taoism very much and quote Taoist texts all the time. The two consume each other, which is the bats of the air is like either objectivity itself or perhaps subjectivity and in the mind and the earth is its opposite, and the two are consuming each other, and then we are told she goes into a dream within a dream right there, which would be the subjectivity and the objectivity uh, symbiotic consuming each other. I do think that does make a good deal of sense, and I did not have time to mention that in the talk, and much thanks to him. So she, Alice, follows a rabbit into a frustrating hall of locked doors and can't solve the problem of the golden key, which sits on a three-legged table. Like the golden goal of ethics balanced on a syllogistic three-legged logic. She cries and demands she stop crying this minute with no patience for herself and too passionate to follow her own advice. We then have a chapter break. And in the next chapter, Alice struggles with action. In many ways, she is passionate and trying to act, but in this she does act. It transitions from her having passion without being able to act to then a bunch of acting and swimming. Alice struggles with action in many ways as she meets the mouse. She considers the useless action of sending Christmas presents to her feet. Wittgenstein said, why can't my right hand hand my left hand money? 
because the action would have no effect. Your hand or your foot is not endeared to you as another human being is. There is no emotional effect, and thus the circuit and the situation is not the same. She can't remember who she is, so she tries to act as others can't. But instead of reciting a piece about a busy bee to act to uh, therefore be who she is through action, and so the busy bee is a busy bee, storing up activity is the essence of what the bee is. The poem warps into a crocodile welcoming fish swimming into its jaws, which means all the fishes swimming, ironically enough here for Alice, isn't going to get the fish anywhere. They still go into the crocodile, much as Alice is just swimming further into the dream and consumed by her own, say, subjectivity and or with the objectivity. Alice says she won't return if others want her back, but then cries and wishes they would come find her. So she will act, she won't, I wish others would for me. She falls into her tears, enveloped further by her passion, but instead of simply enveloped by passion in this chapter, she sees a mouse swimming in her own hopeless situation, a lowly creature, specifically like herself in this situation, and speaks to him of cats and dogs, foolishly, not understanding her own situation well, and as uh, she's not acting in it yet, expressing her passion but not thinking of his. So he reacts and swims away. Aristotle's examples of action are burning and cutting, and the mouse, oddly enough, keeps getting emotionally singed by Alice, and he keeps cutting on her without a word. And we know Carol knew that pun because he uses the pun cutting with the pudding and the queens in the very end of the second story. They agree to swim to shore together, joined by many others who follow their actions, swimming in their wake. So the chapter concludes with Alice following the action of the mouse and everyone else following the actions of Alice and the mouse. In the next chapter, with the chapter break, break, we are told in the first words, reaching a steady state on the shore, the party assembles, a stately party, on the bank. I do believe the banker is the state in the snark. And Alice feels she has known them all her life. The mouse tells a dry tale about William the Conqueror. Now, William the Conqueror is supposedly the original state patriarch of England. Alice, uh, rather French though, I think. Alice isn't dried by the stately story, and the dodo solemnly moves to adjourn the meeting and adopt another motion. They run the caucus race, unashamedly state, in a circle without explaining what they are doing, and the dodo says shape doesn't matter as if all nations behave the same regardless, regardless of constitution, as Aristotle would, would say, which is the shape of the state, not a piece of paper. The dodo decrees everyone has won, and all get prizes Alice has to pay for out of pocket. The dodo, which is taxes. The dodo symbolically, thimbolically, gives her a thimble, a formality that has no effect, like giving gifts to one's feet wouldn't. Adding death to taxes, the mouse then recites a poem about a dog who is judge, jury, and executioner, all the positions of state justice, to explain why he fears larger creatures. Alice frightens the animals off, but some make polite excuses. In the next chapter, the rabbit returns, still worried about the superiors of higher position, and mistakes Alice for his subordinate servant Mary Ann, ordering her into his house to fetch his things. She accepts the order and fills his entire house, in occupying the entire position available. Aristotle's examples of position include sitting and lying down. He says you can't contradictorily do both at once, but if you look at the image of Alice in there, she seems to be doing both at once uncomfortably. There are a lot of examples throughout Alice in Wonderland that look like they are designed to specifically contradict points of Aristotle, either that or complement the points Carol likes, of course. Alice considers how much her position has changed and thinks her story should be put in a book, the position she is in, for us. She wonders if she will ever be in the position of old woman and hates the thought of remaining in the position of a child with lessons forever. The rabbit calls for Bill the lizard, his lowly servant digging for apples, trying to find something of value in too low a place, just like his master does with him, as Bill fails to eject Alice after they position him on top of the house with ladders lashed together. Alice says she wouldn't want to be in Bill's position, shrinks and runs into the woods where she finds herself in the opposite position, scared of a monstrous happy puppy. She looks above the mushroom, higher than her in position, and finds the caterpillar. In the first words of the next chapter, the caterpillar and Alice look at each other for some time in silence. He asks her, asks her who she is, and she says she knew this morning but has changed so much since then. The caterpillar asks again who she is and circles back to where they start started, like the hookah and smoke circling over his head. Alice says he ought to say who he is first, turns to leave, but he asks her to return and keep her temper. This is critical because she was just very passionate and losing it. She does. 
She swallows her anger and waits several minutes for him to speak, and he asks her to speak instead, treading more on her patience and to recite Old Father William, a poem about an elder who says he looked to the future and gives wisdom to the young. But Alice's father, William, is a fat fool who stands on his head, argues with his wife, balance eels on his nose, and tries to sell the youth medicinal oils, which shows he has learned nothing over the course of his life. The caterpillar tells her it is wrong from beginning to end, its entire duration. Alice waits patiently for him to say something as he leaves, and the caterpillar rewards her with the mushroom. This is why her patience is crucial. That will solve her problems of size with the golden key, but that is after talking to a cat in a tree and learning perspective and space. Time and space are key because they teach Alice patience and perspective. The caterpillar and the cat. Similar names, indeed. Caterpillar and cat and categories. Alice meets an impatient pigeon who attacks her, defends its young, and has no time to hatch eggs, wait for serpents, and get sleep. Since the highest tree in the woods is not safe, is there anywhere? The pigeon is impatient. The pigeon serves as counterweight, showing, unlike the caterpillar and unlike Alice, not patient. Reasoning logically, but pay, uh, impatient. Unlike Alice, Alice, patient with the pigeon, feels for her, where shown Alice is opposite. Says and says she is young too, but eats eggs, and the pigeon makes the hasty, untempered judgment that little girls are some kind of serpent and has no time, she says, to further relate to or feel for little girls. In the next chapter, after the break, and this is the part where in this chapter, space and relations are intertangled. So what do we see in the very beginning? Well, Alice watches space get intertangled in relations as the queen's fish footman from the larger sea tangles wigs with the Dutch frog footman of the smaller pond. That would be the queen in the four forms of proposition, the universal, the sea, and the smaller pond, the frog, who is the frog footman at the duchess's door, the frog to the fish, who is more the particular some not. In fact, the frog is holding out the other, which would be some not. So inside the house is immediately the Cheshire cat. In fact, we do meet space or see space before we hear of the Duchess just before. So in fact, space does get placed before relations and in the same space. But in fact, first the Duchess talks, the cat does not talk to her, and then space gets the last word and to explain all of what's going on, which is the part of the theory which seems a little bit backwards because space technically talks to Alice after relations, the Duchess, which pulls the order slightly out, but we actually technically do see the cat first and that is mentioned. And then he has the final word, I think, because it didn't make any sense in ways to have the cat explain everything before the Duchess. It makes a lot more sense to have the pig incident. It turns the baby turns into a pig on Alice, and then the cat explains what the cat understands as all of space and all of the perspectives back and forth, partially viewed at a time. So the Duchess is abusive and neglectful, in charge, but she is terrible at relations. Now the cat is sort of space of all the spaces. He's there in her space, but she actually that's her house, and he then appears elsewhere in space when he wants to. The cat and duchess, as mentioned, share the same chapter without speaking to each other. The sharp-chinned duchess is divisive, thinks her baby sneezes to displease her, and gives no glance to the cook who fills her house with pepper and throws everything but the sink. Later, the duchess fears the queen but boxes her ears and gets arrested. In the categories, discussing relations, Aristotle says beauty might not be endlessly relative, as something could exist that nothing is uglier. Unfortunately, the illustration of the Duchess is just such a portrait. I forget the historical... The, unfortunately, the Duchess, who is supposed to be a hideous, uh, forgive me, looking woman, is actually modeled on an actual royal woman. I forget who. I think she is Dutch. I don't know. But there was such a portrait, which actually is a painting. Um, and people pointed out, I don't have that in my notes right here. But yes, sadness. When Alice takes the baby outside, it turns into an ugly pig, which Alice finds hideous, and then she reacts to it and new perspective outside the Duchess's house by abandoning the pig in the woods. Duck rabbit wise, a la Wittgenstein, the perspective and the space has shifted. And thus Alice relates in relations to the pig differently. Here, still in the same chapter, the Cheshire cat appears in a tree, enticing and intimidating. He has a fixed smile. Wittgenstein says a fixed smile is not a real smile, not a good one anyway. A fixed smile is like a cat playing with a mouse. It's happy, 
but it's fixing itself in a way that it's bracing and it's not uh, sharing the happiness with you because it's concealing its own motions from you. It's the side Alice loves and the side the mouse fears together, like a baby or pig depending on which branch we sit. The cat cares as little where Alice goes in space as the caterpillar cares about how much she changes in time, and both have lessons for Alice, patience and perspective. Caterpillar, Cheshire Cat, categories, and they are time and space. And that is how I solve this thing, is figuring out uh, the caterpillar is time, which, uh, with the help of uh, Juliana's observation about the bellman and the snark being time, which I do believe is carries over to the snark, it all clicked together once the cat is space, and you look at the categories backwards, it fits very well. And I think that's exactly how Carol might want us to get to it, recognizing the caterpillar is time and the cat is space, because those two are crucial moments and characters for Alice. At Oxford... I always left a little of my heart in my native San Francisco. At Oxford, Carol missed his family in Cheshire, Cheshire Cat, so some part of him was there while the rest of him was elsewhere. He is from Cheshire, the place, which would make it space. The cat translocates without moving and partially appears, just as we see only part of space at any given time. In the illustration of the cat's head grinning above the argument in the Queen's Garden, and of course he could be there too as space, he seems both figure and ground, the overall and particular positions. Come to think of it right now, in fact, the Duchess, I believe, is some not. The Queen is all not none. The Cheshire Cat manages to get into both negative spaces freely. And as if no one can do anything about it. Because he's space itself, so no matter how negative the Duchess is partly, or the Queen is fully, it doesn't matter to the Cat. He can not only look upon a king, as Carol says, but actually, uh, in the stories, can translocate in space as space. The cat implies we are all insane to others who face or go the opposite way. Each are in our own place and all bad at relations. He vanishes but returns twice, first to ask what happened to the baby, and then to ask if Alice said pig or fig, which shows he is forgetful. He's master of space, but not time. Those puzzling lines don't make sense to me other than it shows that he's not everywhere in time at once but he is in space. Alice says that madness can exist without sanity, and that Socrates can't be sick and healthy, mad and sane, at the same time. But this is entirely contradicted by the Cheshire Cat, whose point is entirely opposite Aristotle's, as we and Socrates are all insane and sane, depending on placement and relation with others, the two categories of this chapter. In the categories, next chapter, Aristotle's ex examples of poor quality are rudeness and madness. That characterizes the Tea Party, the next chapter. And the cat warned Alice, there's rudeness and madness. This specific, uh, the poorness of this category of quality, either way she goes. Everywhere you go, you know? They're both on full display at the Mad Tea Party. The Heron Hatter lean on the Dormouse as he sleeps, tell Alice there is no room for her at the table, and return her insistence with rude remarks, the Hare uncivilly offering her non-existent wine, and the Hatter suggesting a haircut, which Alice says is too personal. The Hatter asks her a riddle with no answer, and the party baselessly claim Alice doesn't say what she means, with each substitution further from what she meant in the particular moment. The hare uses the best butter, which doesn't matter, but that, because the hatter's watch is still broken, as the best in quality isn't best if poorly used. It actually is very bit of pragmatism and utilitarianism uh, Carol certainly does approve of, is that the best poorly used is not best. Hopefully I use this evidence in the best butter well. And time stands still for both of them, so neither can grow and improve. The Hatter says perhaps Alice hasn't spoken to time, but she has. If the Caterpillar himself is time, and none of them would know it. The party doesn't consider the future when they're fully around the table, and would rather listen to a, the Dormouse's story about sisters who are sick and stuck in a well, which is similar to their own position and situation. They are sick of poor quality and stuck outside of time in a well. Alice leaves what she says is the stupidest worst tea party ever. That would be poorest in quality is her final words. Next chapter, chapter break. Now that Alice has learned patience from time and perspective from space and survived the timeless tea party that goes rounds and ra round and round and nowhere with a bit of syllogistic Boolean logical reasoning, by the way. Please see Bool about that. I do think the mad tea party mocks Bool and the white rabbit is very much, and a bunch of other things are mocking Aristotle, 
White Rabbit is confused man and beast. Bool is separated man from passion and beast by a dream, the Dormouse. Alice solves the the golden key table problem, which does seem syllogistic now that she's talked to folks out in insane, poor quality logic land. But she finds in Eden, in the chapter in which she's solving this tr- this table-like puzzle, which seems logical, she finds in the garden not Eden through this, but quantities, numbered playing cards, painting white roses red, the white innocent, somewhat into the world of now we step into the universal with the queen and the king and the white roses are painted red the two five and seven of spades which is clearly uh the two gets between the five and the seven in an argument there is an addition and or subtraction problem with a bit of division and they fall on their faces as the rest of the pack march by in pairs followed by royalty all in order all the quantities march by in order past the unruly uh well the unruly sum Neither the queen nor knave know who Alice is, and she has neither number nor class. The knave smiles silently so he won't lose his head, and the queen casually tosses her head much as she would his. Alice reassures herself they're all merely symbolic, like a figurehead. The queen calls for Alice's head, contradicts her, and nothing happens. To the queen, her cards are completely dispensable. They're forms without individuality. So she is giddy when they bow up and down, as Alice was with the Cheshire Cat, their numbers and classes disappearing and appearing. She sees nothing else of them, and neither do their card executioners. Carroll and other logicians of his day were seeking rules and foundations for mathematics and logic, like a lawless croquet game where the equipment doesn't behave and there are no orderly turns, which is also like politics and British history. Alice thinks of escaping the place, and the Cheshire Cat appears. So she thinks about place and going somewhere else, and there's the cat. Well, I think the cat is place. He appears and he asks her how she is getting on as he is placed in space and can appear there or anywhere else he likes. And Alice is thinking of leaving. Alice waits for his ears to appear and the others get into an argument once his ears appear over whether they can behead him before they can resume the game. The executioner says if it doesn't have a body like symbols and forms without content in number quantity realm, then it can't be beheaded, but the king insists. The queen says everyone will die if the issue isn't resolved, the sum of everyone. In discussing relations, Aristotle says some animals have no heads And again, the Cheshire Cat entirely contradicts Aristotle with his example. At this point in the next chapter, there should be substance. But Alice and the Duchess trade false morals. We learn there are no actual executions and meet two liars who lack substance. The Griffin, a myth, and the Mock Turtle. The Griffin tells Alice the fake turtle's tears are all an act, but then joins in his story and both pretend to sob. He tells her it's an act and a lie, and then he continues to back up the other. The Mock Turtle speaks in a deep, hollow tone, and when Alice points out a tortoise couldn't teach in the sea, the griffin shames her. The Mock Turtle says they studied ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision, and the pair use all four on Alice. The griffin claims he studied but speaks with a lower class accent and covers for the Mock Turtle when Alice questions how much lessons can lessen. The pair dance the lobster quadrille, shout and scream with delight, then drop the passion suddenly, showing it's all an act. Alice tells the two her story so far, and they interrupt at old father William, as curious and backwards as could be to them, because they say what they don't mean, while Alice didn't say what she meant to say. Alice tries to recite another poem, but speaks of a lobster who talks when the tide is low, but changes his tune when the tide is high, and of a panther who feeds on substance and an owl who gets the empty dish and then is eaten. The mock turtle sings of beautiful soup we should buy with no description of what substance goes into it, which sounds like false advertising. In the next chapter, chapter break, we had absence and lies. Now the Griffin takes Alice to the King of Hearts court trial of who stole the sweet substance of tarts. By the way, the Lobster Quadrille is its own separate chapter. I do think the last few chapters are about absence, substance, presence. I don't fully know why. uh, I believe there's logic hiding in the Lobster Quadrille, four-sided lobster pinchers. As of yet, I have not read the Lobster Quadrille as well as I would like, and that is just simply more there is to do, I hope, Uh, but yes. So, he takes, the Griffin takes Alice to the King of Hearts court trial. Carol holds the interest of children with sweet treats, such as marmalade, jam, tarts, plum pudding, and bride's cake. A lot. Substance. 
The king, like substance itself, includes all useful and useless evidence and testimony. The large dish of tarts sits in the very middle of the court. Alice identifies the king by his wig, which he wears over his crown, one substance sitting uncomfortably on another on another. Alice grows into a giant as the Hatter insists he is a poor man three times. Well, he's poor quality. So the Hatter says, I'm a poor man. Yes, poor in quality. That is the pun, I believe. And he fights with the Heron Court, both showing poor quality. Still, Alice says they haven't had any solid substantive evidence or testimony yet and is called to the stand as she grows into the largest substance in the room. The king orders Alice out of his court and much as Aristotle says, substance can't sustain contradiction. Not at once in time it can't. The rabbit interrupts with a poem of empty direct references, form empty of content, and the king fills it with content and substance, foolishly fitting individuals from his court trial into the form. The queen wants the sentence before the verdict, the quantity of years of punishment before we know it applies to the actual case. Alex contradicts her, says they're all a pack of cards, abstract categories and ideas, and ends the trial and her dream. She finds herself in the lap of her sister, who listens to her and kisses her forehead. Alice shares her dream, and her sister dreams Alice passes the dream from future child to child. I'm going to break this off here. I am going to break this into chapters, but I want to break my talk here as I work through it slowly, and I did run out of time the first time, into several videos, so I will end corresponding the categories with Wonderland here. I was thinking about covering the four, uh, the four corners of the square of opposition, which I do feel are here, which I do feel is the over-inclusive summon some white rabbit who worries about the impressions of others, the duchess some not, who is including, including others in her house, it's not all, entirely off with the head, but is contradicting and uh, very bad at relations, uh, with others, some not. I believe the queen is then going to universal nun off with the head entirely, and she does not, well, like the king and the queen, they do not tolerate contradiction at all. Some and some not do tolerate some contradiction. That's Aristotle. All or none don't, which is the king and the queen of hearts. I do believe that is the case, but I will go onward, break this talk here, and continue with a talk lining up the looking glass with Wonderland walking through it with the categories, and then we will cover the snark and my other theories about all of this. So much love, much happiness. And again, as usual, I will see you if I do indeed ever see you.